Welcome to Valor Conversations. I'm your host, Jay Trainer. Valor Conversations is powered by CSB Ministries and is the official podcast of Christian Service Brigade. For more information, please visit csbministries.org. And now, on with the show. Well, hello, friends. We continue in our series called Culture Changers, encouraging people to identify, engage, and really impact their respective culture and communities. Uh, We're looking at this series from the perspective of really engaging culture with biblical responsibility. And joining in on the conversation today is a longtime friend of CSB Ministries and current leader of Proven Men Ministries, Nick Liberto. Uh, Nick, I'm really excited that you're able to jump on today. Welcome aboard to uh, Valor Conversations. And uh, first off, let's get started with some of your own backstory and understanding of who you are in the first place. What makes Nick Liberto, Nick Liberto? Yeah, thanks, Jay. I am honored to be here. And yeah, what makes Nick Liberto, Nick Liberto? I would say I have a really amazing perspective and blessing. I was raised in a Christian home. My parents are still married today, which is, you know, more rare in our culture. That is Um, very true. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I was I was homeschooled, uh, but I still turned out normal. Hint, hint, I was homeschooled, so I can make that joke. And um, went to private Christian school. Then I went to Liberty University. Um, actually grew up in Brigade. Uh, my father was a leader awesome. at Chapel Gate uh, Presbyterian Church in Ellicott City, Maryland. And a, a lot of that actually shaped who I am today. But yeah, I have the amazing pleasure of leading a ministry. It's Proven Ministries. We also are known as Proven Men. We also have, you know, Proven Women, Proven Wives, other resources like that. But uh, we still primarily do a lot of stuff with men and our Proven Men brand. Yeah. And we're all about sexual integrity. So Mm. um, the the world today is super sexually saturated. You can't go Mm. anywhere without seeing it. You can't turn on the television. You can't walk through the mall. And because of that, we need to be men of integrity, holding one another up, bearing one another's burdens, and uh, yeah, wake up every morning, put on the armor of God, and and learn how to thrive in our sexually saturated culture. So I, that's probably a 30,000 foot view of me. I'm married with two boys. I have two boys under two years old, been married for six years. So I'm, I'm loving life, to be honest, still losing a little bit of sleep. I have a seven week old but uh that's par for the course yeah and you know what that they they eventually figure that one out i know for in our family our first two my oldest daughter and my son it, it's kind of interesting like they they had the sleep through the night thing figured out at 12 weeks and eight weeks respectively our youngest eight months <laughs> it, it such a change right um and how each kid kind of has their own personality and they don't come with a uh uh, an instruction manual, so to speak. But uh, anyway, I'm going off on a bunny trail and that's okay for uh, informal conversation and podcasting like this. Um, as we really get into some of the meat of this podcast, how do you define culture? Um, and what would you say are some of the responsibilities that men, that men of God really have in culture today? Yeah. So I like that question. How would you define culture? I would say it's, and I'm not an academic, but I would say culture is probably easily defined as that the world with which we live in and the norms and the regularities and the things that we don't even notice anymore. Our, mm. our, our culture is that which we are inundated with, that which we are surrounded with, that which we are saturated with. Um, it's the it's the place we live. It's, you know, like my house, my state, you know, culture is that which permeates pretty much everything around us today. Mm. Um, and that's, you know, how I see it. Uh, and that further reinforces why as men, we need to be aware of the culture, not blind to the culture. I would say as men, we are even more to be on guard. Our our culture is, is not friendly to Christians. We're becoming more and more post-Christian as a nation um, and as a culture. Uh, men are often 
shamed and stigmatized and, and to be a true man. I don't know if anybody actually knows what that means anymore. And so mm. I would say it would be wise to go back to scripture in studying manhood as uh, God tells us what manhood is and what man, what men have been as outlined in scripture. Um, yeah, because culture can lead us astray very quickly. So we can't allow culture to be our true North. That's why we need yeah. scripture. That's why we need God as our true North. So that's the short answer. Yeah. The, the whole idea there with culture and the different voices in it could so easily, uh, rule the day so to speak, if we want to use a cliche, but yet how oftentimes that battle is going on, especially with your background, talking about sexual integrity uh, and the proven ministry motto, the proven men aspect of things in the context of CSB. Uh, talk a little bit for a moment how uh, you have been integral in shaping the culture of proven men. I know this wasn't on the original list of questions, but man, let's talk about it because you and your organization certainly have a culture. So does CSB Ministries. Um, what is it that is your true north outside of the word of God now, or included in the word of God? What is your true north in shaping the culture of proven ministries? Yeah, I would say our primary culture model is to create a band of brothers in the proven men aspect, a community where you're not in isolation, you're not alone, and you can lock arms with one another because so much of our culture today isolates and and we're seeing right anxiety depression isolation just going through the roof and so one of the things that i've had a primary role in shaping is right we're not just a, a porn recovery ministry we are about coming together as men locking arms, being passionate about sexual integrity. We can make sexual integrity cool again. It doesn't have to have the shame and the stigma around it. But then I would say another thing that's really practical is I have come into this ministry as a millennial. And so the culture that I was raised in was the first generation, one of the first cultures on the internet and okay. social media and free pornography at a button's click away and gonna swipe now. Right. I mean, exactly. So, so because of that, I'm a little bit more motivated. We use a lot of, you know, 21st century techniques, technology, stuff like that to basically say, you know, we can go analog, we can go old school. Technology isn't the answer for everything. But uh, yeah, I would say I have a unique perspective because the culture I was raised in, even in a homeschooled home, even in a private Christian school, even in a Christian college, was still tremendously sexually saturated. And so I'm passionate about equipping men, women, families today to better withstand that part of our culture and to thrive and to essentially build a new culture that's not the world's sexualized culture. Hmm. Talk about the nature of some of that social media element of things. Um, with my communication background, the thing I've learned is that we are blitzed, we are bombarded by 5,000 advertisements in one 24-hour period. And the buzzwords you're using are right on point isolation, uh, shaming, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And if you don't buy said product, if you don't invest said product, then all of a sudden you are subhuman, right? So talk about some of the social media ramifications and how you have developed a presence online, internet, social media with proven ministries. What are, what are some proactive things you guys are taking, not just as you said, a porn recovery ministry, but beyond that, being proactively uh, on the offensive to prevent a fall in the first place. Yeah, I would say as a ministry, we find that it is necessary that we wade into the mess that is social media. Mm. Uh, we have to go where culture is because we are trying to pull people out of that river that's eating people alive. And so... Uh, as a ministry, yeah, we do go there. We have a social media presence. We have a pretty vast and large internet presence, but hmm. we do that and then we kind of not bait and switch, but we encourage them as we pull people out to connect into real community, to get around a campfire, to get together in a living room. And so that's kind of how 
how our ministry is unique in that we don't have these vast array of digital resources to help people. We basically say, we're never going to digitize some of our stuff because I want you to open up the word and your study and get before God in the morning, but we can make it cool. We can make it attractive. We can show you it's worth it. And yeah, that's kind of the work that we do. And yeah, social media in general, I think, you know, I'm definitely not the one who comes out the gate dogging on it hard, but it's definitely full of a ton of traps. It's my wife and I literally last night were talking about, having a fun competition in the house of who's got less screen time and she's limiting her screen time. And yeah, like I couldn't, we, our ministry probably couldn't function without the internet and social media on on some level. I could, but not at the scale that we're, we are, but Mm -hmm. I, I think it's wise, just like anything else. You and I are not encouraged to go eat a Big Mac every day from McDonald's that goes badly. And equally, you need to have self-control around things like social media. And, you know, I'm talking about adults now. The Mm. conversation will change drastically if we're talking about kids being on social media because their minds are not as well equipped to handle just the, like you said, the thousands and thousands of pieces of content and ads and, and things that are constantly they're being bombarded with. And and almost it's not even should be a question anymore. The reason we're seeing teen suicide go through the roof and depression and anxiety. I, I don't even think it's argued anymore that social media is playing a major role in that. So if you're a parent listening, maybe just double click on your your technology policy in the home for your kids. Yeah, check that. Check out that history right on the school computer or something along those lines too. Uh, talk about the role of accountability. What role of accountability uh, what role does accountability have in your scope of ministry and its relationship with culture? Yeah, I would say accountability is everything for the work that we do. You can't be by yourself trying to solve these problems. Anything with sexual integrity requires accountability and we need accountability everywhere in life. Mm. Um, I think accountability is just a word now people throw around. And I mean, realistically, it's just you don't want to be by yourself on an island. No one would. No one does. As much as the movies have maybe glorified that with your your beach volleyball, Wilson. And, you know, I mean, (laughs) anyway. uh, Yeah. So accountability is just doing life in community, having having people that can sharpen you, that you can sharpen them, not being prideful thinking you can do it on your own, having it all together. And so I would say what we see in scripture, the way we were built by God, we were not meant to be alone. And so that's not just like a marriage reference, even like we, we, we are communal beings. Uh, the mm-hmm. Trinity is a, a hearkening back to that. And, and so, yeah, accountability can be another word for community at different times, but it's just, don't be by yourself. Don't try and go it alone and and have those around you and and do life together, all aspects of life together. Now, one of the things you guys are doing with Proven Ministries, I love, and I I want you to talk about it a little bit, the branding aspect of things. When When you hear the word ministry in a name, automatically it can be assumed that it's part of the Christian subculture in some respects. And yet you are reaching into a different uh, sphere, if you will, with uh, the sex talk. Talk about that a little bit and who your audience is with that messaging and where you're going with that. Yeah, thanks for asking. Yeah, we we have tried to stay cutting edge when it comes to branding, marketing, communications. You know, I, I think ministries need to continue um, innovating. I think that's uh, unfortunately something we see is ministries stop to innovate and that's when they slowly start to die. Um, but for us with this new resource we have called the sextalk.com, it's uh, a really cool new resource that's a preventative resource. We've we we've done other things that are preventative things, um, but this is the first and the tip of the spear for us now. And so very, mm. very simply, it's an, a video online course with interactive capabilities and downloadable PDFs. And and it's 13 videos, eight hours of content. We flew all over the country filming experts, and it's just the closest thing to an easy button that we could make for parents to learn about having the sex talk with their kids. Um, That kind of does go back to the culture conversation, because 
I was literally sitting in a, uh, a, a women's ministry leaders office yesterday. And she was talking about how all the, the high school kids in the youth group are, are talking about, uh, gender and they're expressing some confusion and maybe they want to be a boy and maybe they want to be a tree or, you know, all the, all the different <laughs> things that are out there. Yeah. And and our culture is currently undergoing a massive shift when it comes to sex and sexuality. And so parents do not have the luxury of waiting on some level. They need to be leaning in now and beginning to process. Mm -hmm. And so the sex talk dot com is just teaching parents how to start that early and often with their kids. We, we tell them we want them to start around the age of six with basic wow. biology anatomy and terms that's a defense for your kids the amount of stories we hear of a child who is being babysat and the only thing she could tell her mom is i don't like when john pokes me with a stick and and you need to give your kids a better language than the word stick and mm -hmm. you know you need to have regular ongoing conversations so that your kids know you will be proud of them if they come and tell you they're struggling with something and and your kids know beyond the shadow of a doubt that you are the place they go to ask questions about sex and sexuality and so we're just trying to help parents uh lean into the onslaught that culture is is throwing at our children and and as christian parents we need to be on the front lines of this because you could be the best parent in the world but because you're not locking your child in a closet, they're going to have friends. Their friends are going to have smartphones. There's going to be sleepovers. The school bus is the number one place of exposure. So it doesn't matter wow. how amazing of a parent you are. We live in a world, unfortunately, where we have to equip our children. It's not if but when they will be exposed. It's not if but when they will encounter things of this world that will want to chew them up and spit them out the other side. And if they don't have mom and dad to lean on, they're going to Google things and they're going to lean on their friends. And and that's what we're trying to help with. Well, and it's neat, again, that you encourage relationships within the family with that, too. Uh, and as much as it is purposefully proactive and preventative, um, see the alliteration there. Uh, I think it's really neat, again, that it strengthens relationships in the home in the first place. Any thoughts? Of, yeah. Any, any add on yeah. to that? Yeah. I just further coming back around to your question as far as like social media and culture stuff. Yeah, we we are. I'll tell you a story. It's really cool. So if you know anything about Harley Davidson, it was a really cool motorcycle company that developed a really great product. And that product became known and adopted as an American identity because mm. it means I'm American. It means I'm a, you know, go getter. The rules don't apply to me very, very much of an American identity. That's why people will tattoo that logo on their bodies and they'll mm. wear shirts of Harley Davidson. And so we've in the, in the last six years, we've had several individuals tattoo themselves with our brand. That was not by my prompting. And, wow. and it told me something it was a litmus test for me or it was a sign. It means that our branding is working because if you want it to be known as a proven man, it doesn't mean that you're a porn addict. It means that you are a man of sexual integrity pursuing God in community. Mm. It is it is something you want to be identified as. And so it's been a cool thing to see that our communications and our branding and our marketing is working. And we're, we're making sexual integrity cool again because there's no reason it's not. And saving yourself from marriage is not uncool. And I can, you know, speak from experience as far as that goes. And, and yeah, we just need to start telling a different story. That's awesome. So we hear about purity culture today, particularly in the church world. And for me, I grew up reading books like I Kiss Dating Goodbye. Uh, what are your observations about some of the messaging that comes from this side of things? What's the narrative within purity culture today, would you say? Yeah, I have a unique perspective on purity culture because I grew up in the middle of it. Um, I remember the I Kiss Dating Goodbye. I had the True Love Waits ring. I remember the rubber band you'd wear on your wrist and snap it when you had a bad thought. I, <laughs> all that, I was there. I was in it. Um, so I would just say that 
a lot of people like to hate on purity culture, but it, it had some good intentions behind it sure. and it fumbled the ball quite a bit as well. So we see people going into marriage that were told their whole life sex is bad. And then all of a sudden, you know, after they walk through the altar, sex is good now and, and they don't know how to process that. And and I would say most of purity culture is just simplified as we just didn't do a good job of explaining. And there was a little mm -hmm. bit too much of a because I said so or I say so or because God says so. And we we didn't explore the the design behind behind sexuality like he made it it's awesome there's no reason not to tell that to your kids at any age as mm -hmm. long as you're doing it right because what has god made that we shouldn't be able to talk about and so mm -hmm. i would say as a response to purity culture um we have learned uh, a lot of people have learned some people haven't but that the the answer of because the bible said so it's not a good answer for millennials. It's not a good answer for Gen Zers. Uh, that's a part of the answer, but you just have to go much deeper than that and and explore the design beyond, behind right humanity and Adam and Eve and procreation and sex and sexuality and 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 what we see in scripture. So I would just say, you know, as far as purity culture goes, mm -hmm. you know, probably a lot of the listeners experienced it, were potentially harmed by it. Um, yeah. You know, we're seeing we're seeing things like, you know, the unfortunate amount of churches that are in serious trouble right now because they shove things under the rug that they shouldn't shove under the rug when it comes to sexual abuse and or they take advantage of their power. And so a lot of the work that proven ministries is doing is just trying to take the shame and the stigma off of sex mm -hmm. and sexuality and, you know, struggle, pornography, lust, masturbation, all of that. It's like, Hey, we can talk about these things. It, it, they're mm -hmm. designed by God, the good things and the, the evil one has twisted them mm -hmm. and, and we need to not shy away from it. And so, yeah, coming out the other side of purity culture, I'm seeing a lot of hope, all the ministries that are around today are really doing an amazing job hmm. of going deep and, and not just, you know, creating that culture of just say no. And we're not going to tell you why, because this is icky and bad. And and that's kind of the other thing that, you know, not trying to make any sort of plug here, but that the sex talk dot com addresses. It's teaching mom and dad how to do that. And not just say, you know, we don't talk about that or or we can't have right. these conversations. And no, we want you to make sex and sexuality so normal in the house that it's just like talking about the weather. Hmm. Fair enough. Fair enough. And that is so countercultural to what many people have grown up talking about or not talking about. The non-conversation, right, can be so damaging. Uh, for an individual, especially uh, when the answer just stops at because I said so. Uh, there's no relationship that flows after that. So with all that being said, how should our churches today be equipping men specifically? Because most of our audience are, are, are guys that are going to be listening to this. How, how should our churches be equipping men in their interaction with culture as a whole, would you say? What are the right responses for men to have with culture? Yeah, that's a really good question. So because of the work that we do, I get a unique vision on the landscape of churches mm. and men's ministry. And it is sad to say that men's ministry is waning tremendously, that mm. men in the church are waning tremendously. Women are thriving, and that's a very good thing. Um, but as far as it comes to men and the church, I think churches have not been able to figure it out. It hasn't been easy. It hasn't been simple. And because of that, not necessarily a fault, but they've just pivoted in other directions. Children's ministry, mm -hmm. family ministry, women's ministry, uh, Sunday morning ministry. And so, you know, I would just prioritize and encourage pastors to do the hard work. Because when you get men on your side in the church, you can kind of do anything after that. You mm. can, you, you, a lot does unlock, but it does take time to get there and it's a little bit more work. And so if you're a man in a local church, don't wait for your pastor. Don't wait for 
any of the other leadership, like you can start now, like start getting together with other guys. Mm. It's a lot more than eating a hot dog and throwing cornhole at a cornhole board, right? <laughs> like, which, you know, is kind of what we see. It, it can be going deep. It can be, you know, doing things that CSB is all about, whether it's getting out in the woods, doing some father son stuff, engaging with the other men, you know, whether it's around a campfire, you know, whether you go shoot guns together, whatever you like. Mm. Um, but it's just doing life together. It's not doing a, you know, a barbecue to death together. It's doing life together. And so just, you know, a cool thing that I've done with a couple of buddies of mine in my church is I didn't wait for the leadership. We didn't wait. You don't have to wait. And um, we started meeting once a week, just grabbing coffee, just talking about life, whatever it was. Then we were like, hey, this is a really great time. We've been meeting consistent, consistently. That's another thing. Consistency. Men lean in. Men commit. Like, it's OK. Like, okay. let's break that. But uh, I, I I have like my father and my wife's grandfather. They were in like the same prayer. My wife's grandfather was in the same prayer group for like 50 years. It was insane. And I'm like, that's amazing. And so what we did is we're like, all right, let's start, you know, praying together at the end of our meetings, you know, just grabbing coffee together once a week. And then we're like, all right, this is super fun. Let's read a book together. And we've read like 30 books now in like the last three or four years. And we just do a chapter a week. It it could be as simple as that. It doesn't have to be this high end Bible study. I mean, sure, you can do a Bible study together, but like, I don't know, give yourself some freedom. But I would just say for the culture, when it comes to church, when it comes to men, find men in your church, band them together and start hanging out Mm. and and don't stop. And then incorporate your families, throw in a family dinner here and there and and just figure out how to do life together and prioritize it. Because I think we would be lying to ourselves if we didn't say we found a lot of life and enjoyment in that space. So it's more like, why are we not doing a better job of self-care? Because we need that as men. So go Mm. after it. And so the amount of times I'm sending my wife a calendar invite for her to accept for me to go hang out with the guys. And then she's like, yeah, I I accept those. You know, that's the way we communicate because we're too busy. But that's not something I'm proud of, by the way. Um, I'm with you on that one. 100 percent. So as far as the church and culture and men, I would just say, you know, we as leaders need to lead and as men, we need to step up and step up doesn't have to be daunting. It's like just getting a few guys together and having fun and then just keep doing that. Awesome. Well, as we begin to wind down, I love talking with our guests, uh, what a win or an area of passion looks like for them. Something that is life giving in nature. It could be something related to the topic that we are discussing, or it could be something beyond that. So uh, Nick, what's a win for you? What's a, a victory look like for you, whether it's in the professional sense for uh, what you do with regard to proven ministries, or maybe it's just something personal. Go ahead. Yeah, I would say I I love what I do. It doesn't feel like a job, which is a blessing that very few people have. Um, I definitely feel called, but my number one win right now are my two boys. Mm -hmm. Um, I have just made it my mission to make my world about them at this age appropriately. And so when I get home from work and my one and a half year old is like smiling ear to ear and gives me a hug getting home from work, like literally my whole life is perfect. Everything is good. And so I don't know. I would say I just take being a dad very seriously and I love it. I like seeing the world through my kids eyes. I like working together with my, with their mom, you know, doing cool things on the weekends, even when they're this young. I like getting down on my hands and knees and crawling around in the grass, seeing the world through my one and a half year old's eyes. Um, so that's the biggest win for me right now is I love being a dad. That's awesome. Well, and finally, last question. The floor is yours. I keep things open ended uh, typically for the last one. So If there's something that you would like to add or something that you think that we missed, um, the floor is yours with any closing thoughts that you ultimately have. I don't have anything that I think that we missed. I love what CSB does. Um, So I'm jazzed to be on the podcast today. Um, I I am a board member. I don't think that's a secret. So that's a, a unique perspective as well. 
Um, but I, I would just say I'm I'm excited for CSB's future. Um, I my master's was in outdoor adventure sport, so I wow. kind of love. Yeah, I, I love the 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 getting together with guys. I mean, like the memories I have from archery to shooting guns to building go karts to camping the and hiking the AT to rock climbing. I don't know. It was amazing. And so I'm I'm excited to see CSB continue to grow and flourish. And I just am glad to be a part of it. And I just want to say hoorah and keep on keeping on to all those listening that are CSB, you know, guys. Awesome. Well, Nick, thank you for joining in on this discussion revolving around culture and really the different responsibilities as we truly engage it with biblical responsibility. I appreciate your insight. I really appreciate your wisdom uh, that you bring, particularly from the context of your own ministry experiences with Proven Ministries. So thank you again, and I look forward to our future interactions um, down the road. Thanks again. Same here, Jay. It's been an honor. Thanks for tuning into Valor Conversations with your host, Jay Trainer. Valor Conversations is powered by CSB Ministries and is the official podcast of Christian Service Brigade. For more information, please visit csbministries.org. And in the meantime, stay tuned for more Valor Conversations coming your way soon.